understand the political, economic control and the domination of the American colonization society and its agents during the period of its establishment, which continued until the nation's independence was declared in 1847. Edwin Blyden, a noted Liberian educator and statesman, wrote in 1905, and I quote, the new government of Liberia was not the result of popular feeling. It was not the growth of the soul or the soil. It was forced upon the people as a protective measure in consequence of the impositions practiced upon their revenue by foreign adventurers who had no respect for the community which neither was a national nor a colony. The Constitution was invented in the United States and written by alien hands, was adopted without adaptation to local and racial necessities. Moreover, the state branches of the American Colonization Society, representing Maryland, New York, Virginia, and Kentucky, etc., established separate colonies in the new nation. By 1867, the society has sent more than 13,000 immigrants to Liberia. These immigrants encountered resentment by the native people in met on the land that was under the control of tribal chiefs and kings. Elijah Johnson was the head of the first generation of my family to travel to Liberia in 1820. He was born in 1791 in New York and received his freedom following service in the United States Navy during the War of 1812 against the British. Elijah, his first wife, and three children sailed from New York to West Africa on the ship, the Elizabeth, along with three agents of the American Colonization Society and 88 other free black settlers. It might be in, of interest to you to know that Elijah Johnson was a Methodist minister in New York who became a founding member of the first Methodist church in Liberia. My mother's ancestors immigrated to Liberia from Virginia in 1843. My parents James Elijah Johnson and Martha Louise Page married and I was born 84 years ago in Edina, Grand Vassal County, Liberia, a small city located on the banks of the Medlin and St. John Rivers, which form a junction with the Benson River that flows into the Atlantic Ocean. It is and has always been the most picturesque image of my life and travel. I was christened in the first Method, Episcopal Methodist Church, which is now King's United Methodist Church in the dining. I was raised by my grandmothers after the death of my mother five days following my birth. My father was a lawyer serving as a county judge of elections at the time of his death in 1961. Let me share an experience from the days of my youth that is related to the first Episcopal Methodist Church. It was an Easter season during World War II. I was about 10 years old. Because of the risk posed by the war, ships from Europe and America did not make frequent offshore stops in Liberia as they did in previous years. My grandmother had ordered, among other parents, a pair of shoes for me to wear with my Easter outfit when I would give a recitation during the afternoon of Easter Sunday. The order of my shoes was placed with the American catalog company, Sears Roebuck. Unfortunately, the ship had not arrived by the Friday, Good Friday, before Easter. 
That Saturday, my grandmother gave five shillings to a lady who was traveling across the rivers to the main shopping center in Lower Buchanan and requested that she purchase a pair of white canvas shoes for me to use as a substitute for the black leather shoes that had not arrived. The lady returned in the late evening with a shoe box containing two left foot shoes. The trip to the shopping area required a full day of travel. It was Saturday evening and all the stores were closed. This was a dilemma for me and my family. Grandmother tried to console me and assured me that walking down the church aisles to deliver my recitation would only take a short time. I cried. Grandmother insisted. I cried until she promised me a big piece of cake when I returned home from the program. <laughs> I thought about the cake as I walked down the aisles wearing two left foot shoes to recite Twinkle, Twinkle Little Stars. How I wonder where you are. Mm How -hmm. about the sky so blue? Twinkle, twinkle, little star. Liberia and Ohio are often referred by the size to give understanding to those seeking to visualize the mesh of Liberia's total square mileage. Often we read and are told that the country that the country of Liberia is the size of the state of Ohio. In fact, it is reported Ohio is situated on approximately 41,000 to 44,000 square miles with a population in 2012 estimated to be in excess of 11 and a half million. The land area of Liberia is approximately 43,000 square miles and 186 miles spread along the course of the Atlantic Ocean. The country's population was reported in 2011 to be only 4 million. Liberia has room to share, and we welcome you, even if the lights are not all on. Mm -hmm. The city of Akron, Ohio, holds special awareness for many Liberians because it is home to the Firestone Tire Rubber Company, which has and continues to play an important role in the development of Liberia since 1926, when the company negotiated an agreement with the Liberian government for a land lease of 1,600 square miles of land for the planting and procurement of natural rubber over 80 years, and the terms of operation since the 20 years of the Liberian Civil War has been renegotiated and extended to 2014 in the post-Civil War era to ensure the opportunity to harvest rubber from the newly planted trees. Through Mr. Harvey Firestone and his friendship and business relationship with Mr. Henry Ford, Detroit also has a connection to Liberia. The rubber harvested from the trees of the Firestone property in Liberia was used to develop and make tires for the Model T automobile and all the original Ford models, leaving Mr. Firestone at the time of his death in 1938 with sales in excess of $100 million. Under the terms of the newly negotiated agreement, Firestone has committed to the building and rebuilding of schools, hospitals, housing, and infrastructure damaged or destroyed by the Civil War, and additionally has pledged $100 million to the post-war rebuilding efforts of the country. According to reports in 2008, the company signed a new mutually beneficial labor contract with the Firestone Agriculture Workers Union of Liberia. The company employs 6,500 Liberians who work 8 to 10 hours a day, 6 days a week. I have not read the new contract, but I am exceedingly pleased 
if the new negotiated terms are being implemented in the best interest of the workers. In the 1940s, my father, James E. Johnson, worked for several years as a member of, the, of a pool of clerks and typists in the central office of Firestone Incorporated at Harbor, Liberia. The two-bedroom house provided for him and his family did not have running water, inside toilets, or a cooking stove. Little brick sheds located outside of the houses had squatting holes where employees could relieve themselves. Laborers were subjected to even worse living conditions. There were segregated hospitals for blacks and white company of employees, and the common rubber uh, tree tapper was paid 10 to 20 cents per day. According to reports, immediately before the Civil War, laborers' pay had increased to 25 cents at one dollar per day for eight to ten hours of work on the plantations, as it was called. I hope you can understand these conditions. They also have been contributing factors to the Civil War. The cry of the masses against injustice in any country is bound to fester and erupt at some point, regardless of the oppressor's size and military proudness. <coughs> Excuse me. There's a story from the 1940s when Liberia on the side of the Allies declared war against Germany. When Hitler was told he demanded a map of Africa, he placed on the table <coughs> might observe the exact location of the country of Liberia. Leaning over the map, he shouted, where is that country? I can't find it. Goring, one of the generals, replied, so Hitler, remove your thumb from the map. When he did, he exclaimed with disgust, <coughs> excuse me, this little piece of our country Aaron Goring replied, yes, so Hitler, but do not underestimate this. This is a country that is supplying all of the natural rubber, iron ore, gold, timber, and some uranium to the Allies, enabling them to succeed against you. Further, that's the little country where the Americans have built an airfield called Robbers Field and a harbor to defeat us in the North African campaign. Hitler replied, Aha, as soon as we win the North Atlantic campaign, we will move west and run that little black spot out of existence. But you see, things do not always work out exactly as we want and as we exactly want them to happen. I'm reminded of another Sunday at church in Liberia. 